All right. Um, we are coming into the more thrilling part of the book of Exodus this morning. Uh, you'll be glad to know that we will be spending most of our time uh, in the instructions that God gives Moses for the tabernacle, for this sort of extended tent. It wasn't near, nearly as large as often we think about in our minds, uh, but it was significant and necessary. And I do think, and, and you are sensible people and smart people, you can be the judge by the Spirit's witness through the, uh, at the end of the message whether or not this is true, but I do think there is much in here to mine out that teaches us not only about God, but about ourselves and points us directly to God's finished work in Jesus Christ and ultimately to the restoration of all things. If you've been around here, you know that we talk about the gospel as given in Scripture in four moves. There's creation. That's good and beautiful and perfect, and as God intends it. Then there's the fall through the sin of man and all of the death and pain and consequences that come with that. Then there is redemption provided through the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. And too often, people with an insufficient gospel stop there. There's a fourth movement in Scripture, which is restoration of all things, the consummation of all things, wherein our God in Christ will return and set all things right. And we see bits and pieces of that truth and witness through that all throughout these chapters in Exodus. We'll begin today in Exodus chapter 25. And as we're getting to Exodus chapter 25, if you have uh, your Bible, I invite you to turn there uh, now. I'll remind you where we've been. God hears the cries of his people enslaved in Egypt, and he moves on their behalf. And when he moves on their behalf, he does it how? He does it through human beings. Empowered by his own power. They go, God redeems again through the action and working of those he's called to do the work. He redeems his people out of slavery in Egypt, delivers them just as he said he would in uh, an Old Testament sense, saves them. He brings them out. He gives initial provision to them of food and water. He brings them to the, the foot of Mount Sinai, and he gives them instruction. He gives them the Ten Commandments, the law of God that reflect the, uh, the, the character of God. He teaches them how to live. He teaches them how to live. And then he gives them an exposition of those Ten Commandments. He says, these are the commandments, but let me help you flesh that out in daily life so that you see some of my heart behind the commandments with regard to the dignity and the, the sacredness of human life and human beings, and even of the rightfulness of, of personal ownership to property and the respect that we're to have for that, all the way down to laws and uh, the beginnings of what we would consider a modern justice system and legal code. He fleshes that all out, and now it's time. Now it's time for God, in a sense, to return to dwell as we saw in Genesis in the beginning with human beings on earth. But they need to build a place. Not because God needs a place, but because God is intending to teach them and to teach us about who he is as he dwells in a specific place. Not the least of which that he actually is a living being. And though he does not require a physical home, as nearly all other living beings do, he gives them instructions for one, as you'll see, for their good and their security in the struggles and the darkness ahead. New Testament scholar Desmond Alexander said it this way, with the ratification of the covenant at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 through 24, everything is set for God to come and dwell among the Israelites. However, before this can be accomplished, a suitable residence must be constructed. Of necessity, it must be portable, for the Israelites will journey away from Mount Sinai into the land of Canaan. So let me tell you what I hope to do, and we'll see how it turns out uh, over the next 25 or 30 minutes. What I hope to do is, is to bring you 
uh, largely from the outside as you would see it into the inside into the holiest place in their tabernacle as we look at God's instructions for how it was to be set up and how it was to be used. Let's begin now as we read through the text. And you can take a big breath. I will not read the next four or five chapters in full or the the eight or nine really involved because in 25 through 31 you see the instructions for the tabernacle, but in 35 through 40, you see the execution, the actual building of it. So we'll, uh, we'll drop down when we need to and come up and drop back down. Let's look at chapter 25, beginning with verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to, you are to receive the offering for me from everyone whose heart prompts them to give. I want to pause just for a minute. You see a lengthy list there in verses 3 through 7 of the kinds of things they were to bring as an offering. Not only gold and silver and bronze, but different kinds of cloth and fabrics and skins and colors, uh, all to be used in the construction of the tabernacle. But I don't want you to to miss the fact here that, that God, as he always does, takes the initiative here in coming to live among the Israelites on earth, in coming to to dwell with them in his holy presence. He takes the initiative. He invites. He invites them to come and to be a part of what's going to happen. But the people have to respond. He invites, but the responsibility for response is on the people. And it's the same way today. Both in terms of God's invitation to be a part of what he's doing on earth, primarily through your local church, and then through global missions, but also to come to him in your sin and your disconnection and your waywardness and your estrangement from him and to repent of your sin, to lay down your sword before him and receive forgiveness by placing your faith in Jesus Christ and trusting in him alone as your Savior and your Lord, your sustainer and sanctifier. God takes the initiative, but we have to respond. We have to respond. If you look over, let's turn over briefly to chapter 36. Um, You see what happens and how they respond to this invitation to give. Exodus 36, verse 2. Exodus 36, verse 2. Moses summons... Bezalel and Oliab, and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given the ability, and he was willing. Don't miss this. I commented on it a few weeks ago because we were, uh, those of you that are following the, the reading plan that we're on as a church had already read through this, and I didn't want you to miss little tidbits of God's sovereign goodness like this, that he's actually the one who's given skilled men their skills. So if you're a skilled person this morning, with your hands, with building and fixing things, um, like our executive pastor, Jake, is. That's so rude. That, That scripture says comes from the Lord. It's a gift that he has given you. And if you're willing to use that gift, you get to participate more fully in what God is doing. All right, every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability and who was willing to come and do the work. Verse 3, they received from Moses all the offerings. All the offerings. The the offerings were brought to Moses and the elders to distribute. Moses uh, then uh, distributed the the monies out to and the supplies and the resources out to uh, the skilled workers as they had need. The Israelites had had, had brought to carry out the work of construction of constructing the sanctuary. And the people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning. So all the skilled workers who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left what they were doing and said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. You almost see a parallel in this, in my own embarrassment, didn't strike me until right this very moment, But there is a bit of a parallel between our people that are going to do the work in South Africa 
and the opportunity that we have to support them financially. This is, this is what's going on here. But the workers have to stop. They actually have to stop working because people keep bringing so much to them. Verse 6, then Moses gave an order, an order that has never been given in the history of the local church. And he sent this word throughout the camp, no man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more because what they already had was more than enough to do the work. Yeah, I, I am unaware at least in church history, and I'm quite versed in it, uh, of any such command ever been given in the history of the local church, regardless of denomination. I do think here, though, we should pause and just check our own hearts. They're giving out of an overflow of joy and gratitude to the God who has redeemed them, to the God who has delivered them from their imprisoned state in the nation of Egypt. How much more so should men and women who claim to have been delivered by the goodness and the grace of God from not just some imprisoning atmosphere on earth, but from the eternal imprisonment of sin and rightful condemnation, not have a joyful desire to give generously. That's why we talk so much about it here. That's why we talk so much about it in membership. It's not to be legalistic. I'm so anti-legalistic, I almost wrap around the other side towards sin. But it's because it is such a hard issue. It is such a hard issue. Regardless of debt, regardless of income level, regardless of age, giving the desire to give, the compulsion to give, the delight in giving, uh, the desire to sit down and figure out how to be able to give more and give generously is at the heart and has always been of truly redeemed men and women. And even in the primitive state of their understanding of God here, because this really does, contrary to popular opinion, pick up speed through the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And then throughout church, it has been one of two or three defining characteristics of true Christian people has been the generosity with which they gave. So I think there's a word of encouragement there. Look at verses 8 and 9 of chapter 25. Verses 8 and 9 of chapter 25, uh, the Lord gives the command to Moses regarding the tabernacle. Then have them make a sanctuary a sanctuary, a dwelling place for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Exactly like the pattern I will show you. Leviticus, let me turn over just to Leviticus real quick. Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26, 11 through 13. All right, Leviticus 26, verses 11 through 13. I will put my dwelling place among you, and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God. Where have we seen God walking among man before? In the, in the cool of the garden. In the cool of the garden. And there's a very real sense in which God is returning now. In a limited sense, in terms of their uh, access to him, but returning and beginning to unfold in greater ways his redemptive, his redemptive plan. I will put my dwelling place among you and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. That's covenant language. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with heads held high, enabled you to walk with head held high. 
So Moses gets the instruction that the people are to build God a dwelling place, a sanctuary, a tabernacle in their midst. And essentially what the Lord says is out of, out of all of the earth, I'm going to come to one place. And out of all of the people, I'm going to come to one people. And out of all of the tents, I'm going to come to one tent. And out of that tent, I'm going to come to one room. And in that room, I am most directly going to dwell. The language here is to sit, to use as a footstool, footstool connecting heaven and earth, earth together, as it was in Genesis and as it will be again in Revelation. I'll come to one place, to one people, to one tent among those people to one room in that tent and dwell most fully on one box in that room. And if you uh, read later, you see that the tabernacle, as it's constructed, as it's constructed, and you can Google these images later and look, go down a rabbit hole. It's fascinating. You see a lot of great uh, images of exactly how it was set up. You can see uh, modern replicas of it that are set up in desert areas that you can see and walk through. Um, I encourage you to do that uh, at some point uh, in the near future. But there, there was a large, what was basically called the tabernacle, was a large um, uh, wall, cloth wall outside of it. Tall, heavy, thick. We'll learn more about it in a minute. Um, and inside of it were some things that people would encounter as they came through uh, the drapes, the heavy, uh, the heavy drapes that covered the entrance to it. And then you would have an enclosed tent inside of it that had still two compartments. So you came into to one compartment and prepared yourself and only uh, the high priest, the holy priest would go into the holy of holies where God dwelled most fully once a year. But what's fascinating is God has them place the tabernacle at the very center of their life. The very center of their life is God's dwelling place. Twelve tribes of Israel aligned around it, twelve on the north, or three on the north, three on the south, three on the east, three on the west. All their tent doors opened to the tabernacle. And the tabernacle door opened to the east. You remember when man was run out of the Garden of Eden, what direction were they sent out? East. East. God's coming back. He's moving back in with his people. God's clear here that he, he anticipates and requires being at the very center of the life of his people. And I wonder where he is in your life this morning. I heard someone say we are still a Southern Baptist affiliated church. And I heard a, uh, a well-established Southern Baptist pastor and even Southern Baptist statesman, I think you would say, that if you meet a rather, uh, if you meet a, a Southern Baptist, just a an acquaintance somewhere in there, they're a Southern Baptist member of a church, you can bet within 80% certainty that they're a nominal one. That they're a nominal one. What he was saying there is that God is, is not central in the gospel, not the, the central burning, driving factor in their life. I don't know where you have God shoved or compartmentalized this morning, but I would encourage you to ask yourself, is God at the center of my life? Does his word determine how I handle relationships? Does his word determine what I think about the church? Does his word determine what I believe ethically and morally and sexually? Does his word determine what I believe about marriage? And on and on we could go. It's a beautiful thing. And then when they broke camp and traveled, they traveled with the tabernacle in the middle of them. So they traveled around still with the tabernacle at the center as they were on the move, reminding themselves that even on the move, even in times of transition and times when the future was unknown, God was at the center of their life as a community. Now turn back to uh, chapter 27. Chapter 27, verse 1. As you entered the tabernacle, the outer court there, the first thing you would see is an altar of burnt offering. 
And it's a reminder, was a reminder to them, and should be a reminder to us that entering God's presence requires sacrifice. It's not something uh, entered into lightly. Look at what the Lord says, verse 1 of chapter 27. Build an altar of acacia wood, three cubits high. It is to be square, five cubits long and five cubits wide. Make a horn at each of the four corners so that the horns of the altar are of one piece. And overlay the altar with bronze. Make all its utensils of bronze, its pots, to be, uh, its pots to remove the ashes, and its shovels, sprinkling bowls, meat forks, and fire pans. Make a grating for it, a bronze network, and make a bronze ring at each of the four corners of the network. Put it under the ledge of the altar so that it is halfway up the altar. Make poles of acacia wood for the altar and overlay them with bronze. The poles are to be inserted into the rings so that there will be on two sides of the altar when it is carried. Make the altar hollow out of board. It is to be made just as you are shown, as you are shown on the mountain. This is an altar of sacrifice so that as animals are sacrificed, God is instructing them how to build this so that sacrifice can take place efficiently and effectively for the priests on behalf of the people and on behalf of themselves as they're entering closer into God's presence and so that it can be mobile god has thought way ahead of what needs to happen here we find this same language in romans chapter 12 verse 1 after the life burial life burial life death burial resurrection and ascension of christ when paul writes to the church in rome and says therefore i urge you in light of what christ has done what god has done through christ I urge you, brothers and sisters, to view, uh, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, to offer yourself as if dead to Christ, and by being dead to Christ, being made alive in and through Christ, right? Dead for Christ would be a, a better phrase than dead to Christ. Dead to the world for Christ, therefore made alive in Christ for the good of the world and the glory of God. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. I wonder how many times we sing songs in corporate worship in here and we sing with emotion, we sing with movement, but we've not spent a moment that morning or maybe even that week thinking about what it means practically to offer ourselves, our bodies, as a living sacrifice that's holy and pleasing to God. We enter God's presence, and that requires sacrifice. That requires sacrifice. Go back to 26.1. Before, I guess, we get much further into the tabernacle, we want to take a quick look at the, at the tent, at the fabric around the walls of this rectangular-shaped tent. We won't certainly read much of chapter 26 because it is very ornate. But 26.1, as we see God's presence among his people here, that the, the outer walls of the tabernacle were the beginning of this, uh, the significance of and the sign of, God tells Moses, make the tabernacle with ten curtains of finely twisted linen and blue, purple, and scarlet yarn with cherubim woven into them by a skilled worker. By a skilled worker matters. And what we see here is cherubim sewn into the entire outer wall of the tabernacle in a way that, uh, that symbolizes and, and moves forward what we see in Genesis 3 following the sin of Adam and Eve as they're driven out of the Garden of Eden and cherubim are placed there with flaming, uh, flaming swords to guard the perfection and the presence of God from something unholy and sinful entering back in. It is a reminder to the people when they look at this that paradise has indeed been lost due to human sin. And God's presence is now going to be among them. 
but they need to be guarded from the fullness of it. And their access to him and to his presence will be limited. Will be limited. And all day every day as they moved around the outside of the tabernacle, as the priests who camped between the tents of the tribes and the tabernacle itself around it, got up and went about their business. They were reminded that God is holy and that though he has chosen to be present among them in a beautiful and a unique way historically, that paradise still has been lost and that his presence is guarded. Not from them, but they from the fullness of it, lest they die. And then their access is limited to it. But if you go through this chapter, and we won't, you will, you will, we won't, you will see how ornate and how specific God's instructions are for the building, even of this outer wall. And that just ratchets, it, ratchets up with each item that he instructs them to build in it, all the way to the Ark of the Covenant or of the Testimony, uh, the footstool of heaven, the, the, the direct meeting point of heaven, and earth. Rebecca St. James, uh, an Australian-American singer and songwriter, had uh, a song in the early 2000s called Above All. Uh, and some lyrics from that, I think, get at what God was teaching his people about his nature and character. She says, uh, above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth. Those words are exactly right. Exactly right. They speak the holiness of God, the transcendence of God, and they uh, give us a, a modern picture of what God was trying to teach his infant people as he had rescued them out of a land of, of pluralism, a land of many gods, and many varying degrees to which you would worship these gods in different ways and at different times. Now, when you came into the tabernacle through the outer wall, the first thing you encountered was the altar of burnt offering, which we just talked about, because a sacrifice had to be made. A sacrifice had to be made. As you traveled further inward, if you'll turn over to chapter 30. Turn over to chapter 30, verses 17 through 21. The next thing that you would encounter about halfway between the altar and the entrance to the tent inside the outer wall of the tabernacle was a wash basin. The wash basin. Verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, make a bronze basin with its bronze stand for washing. Place it between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and feet with water from it. Whenever they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. Think about the significance here that you and I are unable to come into the presence of God without the consequence being immediate death, apart from spiritual cleansing. Obviously, washing their hands and washing their feet. Now, they were dirty, and they had just done an animal sacrifice. They needed to wash. That didn't cleanse them spiritually, but it symbolized something that was coming. There was coming a day when cleansing would come, and cleansing would be available to men and women, not in the form of water, but in the form of the Spirit of Christ, signified still in baptism, so that they will not die. I don't think you and I have a view of God that big. I think we've lost a big G view of God that reminds us that for every one of you in here this morning, everyone watching line who isn't a regenerate follower of Jesus, kept and held and covered by the grace of Jesus Christ, 
Were, to God, were God to just make the fullness of his presence known, you'd die right here in this room this morning while I speak. Because the sin and the curse of sin under which you rightly sit here this morning knows no response to the holiness of God in his fullness but death. Even the priests called out had to wash so that they wouldn't die. Also, when they approached the altar to minister by presenting a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash their hands and feet so that they will not die. This is to be a lasting ordinance for Aaron and his descendants for the generations to come. They're in the outer courtyard at this time. And they're reminded that sin makes us impure. Sin contaminates us. It contaminates all of us. That's why we, we talk about it uh, uh, doctrinally as total depravity. It doesn't mean every one of us is as bad as we can get. You've heard me say that. But it does mean that every aspect of our faculty has been infected and affected by sin. Our will, our emotions, our intellect, all of it. And we've got to be cleansed. We've got to be cleansed. And God is teaching his people this. Now as we keep moving, as we keep moving, we begin to move uh, to the inside of the tent of meeting. We've been in the courtyard now. The priests are preparing to go inside to the tent of meetings. Let's jump in there. Turn to... Uh, Genesis, Genesis. Don't turn anywhere in Genesis. Turn, uh, turn in Exodus. Exodus 25, verse 31. Exodus 25, verse 31. When you come inside the holy room or the outer room of the actual tent of God's presence, God tells Moses to make a lampstand, or have the people make a lampstand of pure gold. Pure gold. Hammer out its base and shaft and make its flower-like cups, buds, and blossoms of one piece with them. Of one piece with them. And what you see here as you look at this and you look um, later at the instructions for oil which are given at the end of chapter 27 you find that the priests were to keep these candles burning night and day, night and day, night and day. They were to keep the oil. The people would bring the oil. The priests would uh, utilize the oil in the lampstand to keep it burning day and night. So no matter what time of day it was, the people could look and see this light that signified God is with us. Can we just admit that for many people, darkness is scary? For many people in the modern world, darkness is scary. Throughout human history, darkness has been more than scary. It's been terrifying. It's been the abyss of the unknown. It's been uh, the abyss, of, the abyss of, of chaos and condemnation and danger. There was a sense of mystery to darkness. And God wants his people to know that, that in the house of God, at the center of their lives, the light is always on. When you think about your children or your grandchildren, wanting a nightlight or some kind of light on. That's an estranged heart reaching in a sense, knowing that there's something out there that, that I feel like I'm missing in the darkness that comforts me, that lets me know I'm home. I'm not alone. This is sort of baked into, wired into our DNA. Some of you will remember an old, old TV commercial for Motel 6. You remember this? The byline was what? We'll leave the light on. <laughs> Man, you guys spent a lot of time in Motel 6. Yeah. I did too back in the day. My dad'd be like, We're stopping somewhere good, boys. The Motel 6. Got an outdoor pool, some shade of greenish blue. But you know what? The light'll be on. Now, that was hugely effective. It, it, was, 
You know what it was? It was a way of saying, you're welcome. You're welcome to come here. There's going to be a space of comfort for you, comfort-ish for you. Um, and this is what God's doing. He's also reminding them that he is the light of the world. That the world only has whatever physical light it has. Because God commands it to shine. And Jesus would go on to refer to himself as the true light of the world that gives light to all who receive him. So the lampstand would be there. Now turn back to chapter 30. Turn back to chapter 30. Verses 1 through 10, we see the other physical uh, implement that is in that, that outer room inside the tent of meeting. It's got the, you've got the golden lampstand, but you've also got an altar of incense. The altar of incense. God says to Moses, make an altar of acacia wood for burning incense. It is to be square, a cubit long and a cubit wide and two cubits high. It's horns of one piece with it. Overlay the top and all the sides and the horns with pure gold. And I want you to notice as we're getting closer to the holy of holies, the single place in the single tent of the single room in the single box where God dwells, how much more innate and lavish and extravagant the preparation and the pieces become. Overlay it on all sides and make the horns with pure gold and make a gold molding around it. I also don't want you to miss this. Who, whose gold are they using to build the things of God now? The Egyptians. Mm, I like God. I love the way he works. He's like, hey, we're going to pillage them as we leave and then we're going to use most of what you took for the tabernacle. But I also want you to see in this the good and sovereign purposes of God. He sees further than you do. He just sees further than you do. And there are going to be times this morning, times this last week, times later today, and times this next week where you don't understand why he is or is not doing what he's doing. But church, he understands. And, and he is operating for your good. It is the whisper of Satan in your ear that says, don't trust him. He's keeping the good stuff from you. He doesn't really mean what he says. Did he really say? But the word of God over and over explicitly and implicitly teaches us that God knows more than we do and he sees further than we do and he is contending for our wholeness in Christ, for our thriving as human beings made in his image. Yeah, so they don't know all this is coming as they're pillaging Egypt because God had turned the hearts of the Egyptians toward them while they left, but God knew. Verse 4, make two rings for the altar below the molding, two on each and opposite sides to hold the poles used to carry it. And he goes on and he goes on. Look at verse 6. Put the altar in front of the curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant law before the atonement cover that is over the tablets of the covenant law where I will meet with you. Aaron must burn fragrant incense on the altar every morning when he tends the lamps. He must burn incense again when he lights the lamps at twilight so incense will burn regularly before the Lord for the generations to come. There's something beautiful about the consistency here of this. Right? For generations to come, these things are being practiced. And they're teaching the people of God about God and about his place in their lives. I think there's also a, a, an almost a corresponding beauty to the consistency of the church as we gather. As we gather and we participate in worship and the preaching of the word, the ordinances of the church as we baptize and marry and bury, regardless of how up and down the culture is, we're just going to keep meeting. We're going to keep doing this. We're going to keep doing it under the authority of the Lord, trusting his goodness and the power of his spirit. 
And I think when people look around at our culture, which has gone largely off the rails, I hope one of the things where they find consistency is in Christ's church. That we are not scattered and blown around. We've not lost our way. Verse 9, do not offer on this altar any other incense or any burnt offering or grain offering and do not pour a drink offering on it. Once a year, Aaron shall make atonement on its horns. This annual atonement must be made with the blood of the atoning sin offering for the generations to come. It is most holy to the Lord. So once a year, this is the item. This is the altar just outside the inner curtain inside the tent, just outside of where the Ark of the Covenant is kept and God's presence most God's presence most fully and powerfully dwells, that at once a year, atonement is made for the sins of the people, and the high priest is allowed to enter the holy place, the holy of holies, in the presence of God. Keep this incense burning. There was a a very practical reason for doing this. One of the practical reasons uh, was because slaughtering animals is a stinky business. It just is. And when you entered Middle Eastern homes, ancient Near Eastern homes, I should say, at this time, almost all homes had incense burning to cover the smell of very dirty people who did not get the opportunity to bathe or shower. Imagine a middle school where no one's gone home for the year and the showers are broken in the school. Right? So you get incense. We would just need to raise the school to the ground here. But it served this, this, uh, this uh, practical purpose. Uh, it also pointed forward, in the, and, and John picked up on it in Revelation, in the book of Revelation, in chapter 5, verse 8, and says something quite astounding in, in 5, 8, Revelation 5, 8. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamp. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Isn't that, isn't that beautiful that the, that the scent that God most delights in is the prayers of his people? It's not strawberry daiquiri. It's not new car smell. It's not Georgia Spring. It's not pollen. It's the prayers of his people. The altar of incense is in this outer room of the tent of meeting. Look back at um look back at chapter twenty six. Let's move back to twenty six. I'll tell you what, go back to 25. You're almost there anyway. So we'll get you there. Let's already cover that. 25. Nope. All right. Chapter 25, verse 23. The third object, there were three inside this, this outer room before you entered the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was the only thing in there. You find the table, the table for the bread of presence. And here you see a picture of God's presence through his provision. And part of why, let me just say this, because I think we still struggle with this in a modern era, tremendously. Part of why they gave the way that they did was that they were already beginning to learn that God was the God of their provision, right? That literally all that they had had come at his hands, and that he continued to provide day after day after day. So they didn't have to hoard and hold on. They didn't have to worry. They were free to give knowing that, that only an empty cup can be refilled. And to the degree that it's emptied is the degree that it can be refilled. So they're beginning to learn this. They're also learning it right here as we instru- see instructions for this, this third implement, this third piece of furniture. Make a table of acacia wood, two cubits long, a cubit wide, and a cubit and a half high. 
Overlay it with pure gold and make a gold molding around it. Make a gold molding around it. Also make around it a rim, a hand breadth wide, and put a gold molding on the rim. Get down to 28. Make the poles of acacia wood, overlay them with gold, and carry the table with them. We've seen this with each implement. Verse 29, and make its plates and dishes of pure gold, as well as its pitchers and bowls for the pouring out of offerings. Put the bread of the presence on the table to be before me at all times. What you, what you find here is, is, is that this bread of the presence was to be baked fresh every morning. How many of you have ever smelled fresh baked bread? It does something to you, doesn't it? It does something to you, doesn't it? There's a sense in which some of this is just the simple goodness of God among its people. In a dirty world, in a dirty climate, in a climate where you're always wondering, am I going to be fed? Am I going to be fed? Am I going to be fed? And then somehow, there's fresh bread being baked in the tent of meeting every single morning. The people smell it. They're reminded that God is here. God is good. He provides, and he will take care of us. He will take care of us. Now, as we go into the Holy of Holies, there in 25, we see instructions given, uh, given for the ark. And here we see God's presence both as majestic and merciful. Majestic and merciful. We won't go in too much uh, to chapters 10 through 16. They're, uh, they are, are fairly familiar from what we've read already. But look at 17. Make an atonement covering of pure gold. An atonement covering of pure gold. This is, this is the covering upon which God's feet would rest, anthropomorphically speaking. This is the point at which heaven and earth would be joined together at the point of atonement. Two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. And make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. Make one cherubim on one end and the second cherubim on the other end. Make the cherubim of one piece with the cover at two ends. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing and covering them. The cherubim are to face each other, looking toward the cover. Looking toward the cover. So they face each other with their wings up, looking toward the cover, which is bent down. And it's this picture. See, we forget this. Uh, you know, we, we hear songs like Angels Among Us, and we see some angel TV show, show and we see the little, the little fat cherubs in the, in the trinket stores. You go up to North Georgia, uh, and we forget that, that angels, angels are both powerful and fearful messengers of God. Angels are divine warriors. They knew this. And so part of what God is teaching them is that even in the cosmos, the, if you will, the unseen reality of the universe, the most powerful beings there, the divine warriors kneel in the presence of the most holy God. Place the cover on top of the ark and put in the ark the tablets of the covenant law that I will give you. There above the cover between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the covenant of the law, I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. It's, it's a, a picture priestly. I will meet with you. I will meet with you, Aaron, the high priest, the one who, who mediates on behalf of the people. They might be my people, and I will meet in holiness and in power. We get a picture of this in a verse that's familiar to us from 1 Peter chapter 2. When Peter reminds us, and we've read this several times in the last few weeks, you are a chosen possession, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light. Once you were not a people, 
But now you are the people of God. Once you'd not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. They're watching God come to them. And he's telling them, the place in all the universe that I desire to dwell is directly among my people. And I'm going to give you signs and illustrations and examples so that you can know I am indeed among you. I am your provider. And so that you can also know I am holy and righteous and apart from sacrificial death, apart from a sacrificial lamb, death, you cannot enter into my presence. When you look at Exodus 40, these final chapters we're not going to go through, they just demonstrate their obedience in building what God instructed them uh, to build. Look at verse 34 of Exodus 40. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. This, this picture of him, of, of creation, and, and you see again and again, creation narrative language throughout this, even in terms of uh, the series of commands that are given, seven and seven, in the creation account, um, in the instructions for the tabernacle. You see the glory of the Lord shown and present among his people, all pointing toward that time. The restoration of all things, when the new Jerusalem would come down from heaven to where? To earth. Because it has always been God's intent to dwell with his people on earth. This union of heaven and earth. Heaven meaning the full presence and power and person and reign of God on earth among his people, with his people, in delight. Verse 36, in all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle day by day. And fire was in the cloud by night. And in the sight of all the Israelites during their travels, God was with them. And then one day, God came fully to them. We see this in John chapter 1. Let me just, as our band begins to make their way back up here and prepare to uh, lead us in a time of response and reflection, let me read this to you. And I, I pray by God's Spirit, your mind begins to make connections. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Through Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The lampstand, if you will. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. All the darkness that the creative order fallen can throw at it can't overcome it. Verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. We're not the lights this morning. Some of the problem in our timidity uh, evangelistically is that you think you're the light. Now, obviously, Jesus calls us, in a sense, to be salt and light, but not the light. He's the light. We simply testify to him. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and through him, the world was made. The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, not of human decision, 
not of a husband's will, but born of God. Finally, in verse 14, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. He tabernacles among us now. He tabernacles in the hearts of His regenerate people. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, the glory that we just read about descending on the tabernacle as the power and presence of God came down. The Son who came from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. We cannot be His people without at least striving with grace-driven effort in the power of the Spirit to be men and women full of grace and full of truth. I don't know where most of you are this morning, but I hope you get a, a word from God, a sense from God of the nearness of His presence with you. That in pain, in uncertainty, in circumstances that you don't understand, when it's dark outside and when it's dark in here, His light is on. He's present. He's holy and righteous and yet merciful and gracious. And He is your provider. He calls you to be His people to the praise of His name and the glory of His name. Before I pray for us, I want to give you just a minute to finish filling out any connection cards or giving envelopes that you need. As you're doing that, I will uh, pray for us in just a minute. As I pray, our offering ushers will make their way to their positions and receive uh, offering as we pass the bucket. You can drop in those connection cards. Drop in your giving envelopes. If you need more time, take the time you need and drop them in the boxes on the wall on your way out. I know we have a couple of you um, at least who are hanging around for a, a little newcomer's time uh, with Jake and I. look forward to that. If anybody else is here and you're new at Lost Mountain and you want to do that, just hang around out here in the West Foyer, this direction, and we'll be out there shortly after the service to meet you. I also want to say as the ushers receive offering and that's done, feel free at any time if you're a baptized believer in Jesus Christ this morning to step out during the first song, make your way to a communion station, take a piece of the bread, dip it in the juice, move off to the side, and remember that the only reason you can walk past the curtain into the presence of God is because Jesus, the Lamb of God, was slain for you. And as you eat the bread and you drink the juice, you eat and drink His victory over sin and death in your own life. Let's pray and we'll receive offering and you guys will be free to stand and move after that to worship, to receive offering receive communion. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. These are sacred moments, God, where you invite us now to respond to your word. God, many will respond through giving, through deciding that they, they want to get involved and serve God in the pattern of your son and in obedience to your calls and your commands. God, some may be sitting here right now and they feel the call to salvation in their lives. God, they know they're sinful and they're lost and they're cut off from you. And that they are headed toward an eternity separated from you. God, I pray right now that by your spirit, you would save them. That they would cast themselves on you, repent of their sin, place their faith in Christ, and come find one of us to talk to about it after the service. God bless this time. Lord Jesus Christ, as we take communion, may we never do it lightly. I pray this in your holy and precious name.